we should be let's wait and see we should be live yeah we are live and we are here again with liz and ross and this time with gerda liz's last little member of the herd and she's going to introduce us to Gerda. Gerda was supposedly uh, bred for the meat industry in the Netherlands. I didn't even know that there was a meat industry in the Netherlands uh, for horses. And um, she's going to explain to us what she's been doing for Gerda to relieve her of sweet itch. And then she's going to talk a little bit about alignment versus straightness, the Normandy equine way. So Liz, I'm going to put you on speaker view and you have the floor, girl. Hi. <laughs> Hi. See you Hi again. Hi again. <laughs> so this time we're, we're um, in our, now my horses live out, so they have free choice of whether or not they want to come into these shelters. So these are just big shelters that are kept very clean for them and they can, they, they tend to only come in when they're uh, fighting the flies. Uh, even in the middle of the winter, it could be snowing outside and raining and and being really cold and lots of wind, and they'll be standing right next to the shelter. So uh, today's a great way to, to use them. So um, yeah, so today we're here and we're going to present you, uh, Gerda is the way we pronounce it in French, Gerda in, in English. She is about 23 years old uh, that I, as far as I know, uh, she was given to me by a friend of mine who moved away to a city and couldn't have her anymore. And she has been the most wonderful uh, addition to the herd. She is definitely the boss of all the big ones that you have already met. She tells them where to go, when to go. She's always, um, if I take one of them away to work, she'll be the one who's standing at the door waiting for them to come back. So uh, she nannies them when they all go to sleep. And I have lovely pictures that I will be posting of them asleep so my three big ones will be napping and she uh, stands guard and then they all get up and then it's her turn and she lies down and has her nap so it's 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 really worked out very well I mean she's she's and being that she's a bit older certainly when I only had the two youngsters uh, she and they were only two and a half three years old she was definitely the one that gave them confidence and and helped them so she was a has been a great nanny and that and that is her job I um I had these great ambitions of teaching her to uh, pull a carriage and everything. And we did one session um, one summer and then the rest of the summer, she wouldn't let me catch her. So I think she said quite clearly that that was not part of her plan. Um, so I was more than happy to have her here just, just as our nanny and our mascot really. So with no further ado, I will change this around. And here she is. So here's my son, just to give you some. So my son is about five foot 10 or five foot nine, five foot 10. And so you can see that Jada is quite tiny. She's nine and a half hands high. Um, and, but she has the personality of uh, 17 hand warm blood. <laughs> so she, so I'm gonna kneel down a little bit here so you can have a, a better look at her. Um, now, when she first came to me, she was really, really shy. She didn't have uh, any confidence in human beings. Uh, I, I don't know much about her background. All I know is that she was bought by a French dealer who had gone to Holland, bought a whole bunch of ponies to sell them back in France um, as children, children safe ponies. Now she was an unbroken two, three year old and was bought by a family and spent most of her time bucking off their children. So I knew that much about her. And then she went to my friend who had a horse as a, as a companion horse for him. Unfortunately, he died. And then she was alone for about a year and a half in a field and finally came to me. So um, she's very happy here and she will remain here for as long as she chooses to remain with us on this planet. But the biggest problem she has, what is great about Gerda is she does not suffer from founder, um, which is fantastic for us in Normandy because obviously we have very rich grass. So um, ponies do tend to suffer from um, founder. And as you can tell, she's not skinny. She's not the biggest, fattest pony I've ever seen. Um, and they do only live on grass for the summer. They get nothing else but, but grass and salt blocks and... Um, 
um, the occasional carrot and apple, but that's about it. So they do very well on the grass. And, um, but her biggest problem is she does suffer from sweet ditch. So I'm gonna go a little closer to her again to show you. So when I first got her, this white patch on her rear used to in the summer just become absolutely the whole white patch. And this had happened to her for years. So you can see it's pretty extensive and the top of her tail. And if you can just see there, there's little patches um, that are teensy weensy little patches that still remain every once in a while that I treat from the outside. But the top of her tail, you can tell she still scratches a little bit, but it's completely destroyed. If I were to shave it, you would see that the top of the tail is has been destroyed by how much she used to scratch. Um, so again, the damage is pretty extensive. She also gets incredibly itchy on her belly to the point where she will get down as best as she can and scratch her stomach on the ground. Um, and then the other place that she would get really horrible, 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 crusty, pussy, horriblenesses that looked like this, if, if you can see it there like that, okay? She got them all along her neck. It was horrible and just huge amounts of pus and goopiness and, and it would dry and then fall off and pus again. And she, it drove her crazy. She was always, always itching, itching, itching. So I tried all sorts of different things. Um, the one thing that had worked was a concoction made by a local vet that had um, um, oh, steroids in it. And so of course I didn't wanna keep her on that because, you know, but it did work. It stopped the itching and it, and it did heal the skin. So when Monique introduced me to NRF2, um, I figured, well, why not? All my horses went onto it because of different reasons. And with uh, this little one, um, we put her on it and she's on it still today to help with the sweet itch. And what I found is that it, it lessens the itching. I'm not going to tell you that it takes it completely away because it doesn't. But what it has done is it has helped her system keep her skin from becoming really, really horrible due to this uh, reaction to, to bug bites. So um, what I find really interesting is I, I went away recently and for two weeks I was away and the person looking after the horses, I didn't ask her to continue. So we were gone, I was actually gone for three weeks because I went a week away. So this happened while I was, I was away. And it, when I got back, uh, which was a couple of weeks ago, it was flared up and red and bloody and, and, and really pussy and horrible. And the, that would have been the whole length of the top line of her neck would have been like that. Um, and we immediately put her back on the NRF2 and it healed within a couple of days, it, it, it healed up and then it's just been napsy or like that since. So it's not looking the, as pretty as it could, but it's certainly not causing her any problems. It's not been bleeding, it's not been suppurating. And the same thing on her rear. So these little bits that you see coming just through here and here and on this side through in, in here and here, all of that had immediately, well, within the two to three weeks had gone back to being bloody and, and horrid. And now the, the skin is, is much better. So we keep talking to you guys about this NRF2. I'm just going to flip back. So I'm going to explain to you uh, as, as quickly as possible what, what it is really. So what it is, is it's not a supplement and it's not a drug. It's an activator. It's something that activates the body to produce um, antioxidants. So a lot of us take antioxidant supplements. Uh, the favorite one of most people is red wine, because <laughs> red wine is full of antioxidants, which is lovely. But I think you'd have to drink about 120 glasses a day to be able to counteract how many free radicals you have running around your body, which is not exactly um, conducive to good health. Um, the same thing with oranges, you can get antioxidants for oranges, but again, I think you have to eat 320 oranges a day. So yes, very healthy to have all these fruits and vegetables that do produce antioxidants. But unfortunately what they do is they give you one antioxidant to one free radical. And free radicals are quite destructive. They are um, um, 
they're in your body and they're, they're elements, they're not really elements, but we'll call them that for, for today, that are unstable. They're missing an electron. And I'm sure my son will jump in if I say it incorrectly. Um, so they go to healthy cells and they steal them. They steal them from healthy cells, which means that your immune system is put under a lot of stress. First of all, it's trying to deal with the day-to-day -day occupations of a healthy immune system uh, by keeping us safe from everything from the outside and the inside. But now it's also losing um, a lot of its power because it's having to deal with all these free radicals that come along when we eat, breathe, when we're out in the sun. Anytime that we're using energy, we're producing waste. And that waste is what we call free radicals. So what this NRF2 does is it replenishes our natural, it activates our natural um, production of these antioxidants so that we can reduce our oxidative stress. So it lowers the amount of uh, free radicals that are floating within our bodies. And those free radicals, because they're constantly putting our immune system under stress and because they're converting cells into free radicals as well, if you like, because they're making our cells into, into, into um, unstable particles. Um, so, so when we're able to produce the, the NRF2 again, this, this protein that helps us produce these antioxidants, um, we help the body defend itself against all sorts of different pathologies. So that's in a very small <laughs> and as least sort of technical way that I can um, introduce what NRF2 does. And I have to say for us human beings, which is really good for considering I'm 56 years old and hopefully I look pretty good. <laughs> it does it does help with the aging process. It, uh, because obviously oxidative stress deals, uh, you know, affects the way that, that we age. It ages us more quickly. So wrinkles, lines, saggy skin, all that stuff that we love, especially us women, um, is helped by taking our NRF2. It helps promote, um, you know, much more sort of health and vitality within, within the body. Um, right, so having said that, I'm going to see if I can pass this camera over to Ross. And then Ross, what I'd like you to do is just as I am talking, if you can just keep it on me and on Jelda, because we're going to start talking a little bit today about um, alignment. So the reason I talk about alignment quite a bit is because as far as I'm concerned, within the pyramid of training your horse, the first thing you have to establish within your horse is its ability to balance. So it needs, it needs to be able to balance on two main patterns of movement, one of which is the circle. Because Speak up just a little bit. Speak oh. up just a little bit. Okay, we'll come a little closer. Okay, so we use circles for an awful lot of the work that we do, and we use straight lines. So horses are not actually normally um, accustomed to making a straight line. And they certainly and don't go around making circles. You will see foals circling around their mothers, but you won't see usually adult horses unless they're galloping and come to the end of the field making circles. So um, for them to be able to understand how to balance their bodies on these unfamiliar patterns of movement, we as the human being who is ex asking them to do these things have to explain to them how, how to do it. Yesterday or the last time we spoke, we talked about how when a young baby, a human baby is learning how to walk, we, you know, teach them all the way how to do it and we praise them every time they try and we, you know, we, we get very excited when they give us just one step, but a young horse will give you one really good step and instead of praising him for that and then putting him away and then repeating it a couple of days later, we try to get a hundred uh, perfect steps out of him and then when he doesn't give that to us we get really annoyed so keep in mind patience with your horses and and keep relating it back to the fact that horses are not willing participants in our ideas of training they haven't signed a contract there's nobody that's come up to them and said oh by the way I'd like to make you into a show jumper are you okay with that and then saying yes yes that's absolutely fine I will do whatever I need to do to become a show jumper and then 
um, you know, we're disappointed when they break the, the, the word of the contract by not doing what we want them to do. So keep that in mind. Horses have not broken any contract with you. They are not in competition with you. I hear this all the time. Oh, don't let him get away with that. Uh, otherwise, he's going to think he's won. I can assure you, your horse is not competing with you. He is a horse. He will behave like a horse. He will do everything that is horse-like in behavior. But one thing that horses don't do is compete uh, with us. They might compete with each other for food. Uh, certainly stallions will compete for mares. So they do have a concept of competition. But, the, but a horse is not sitting there going, ha, 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 I'm going to try to get away with this. And if I get away with it, I've won. I've won the competition. What he might do is test you in horsey ways and go, now, if I do this and this is how you as a other individual react, then I might be the one who is higher in the hierarchy, but he, they're not looking to compete. So the first thing we're going to look at, and Ross, if you can kind of direct the camera, is to the three points of alignment. If the horse is aligned, it means that the power from the hind end to the front end, back to the hind end, back to the front end, back to the hind end, back to the front end, and so on, I could go on. Um, I'm going to move back to get a better shot. So. Okay, flows absolutely freely. And make sure you don't put your fingers over the... Um... I'm making sure I, I know how a camera works. No, 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 I'm just saying over the <laughs> microphone because you've got your fingers over the right. microphone. Right, sorry. Okay. Um, so there are three points of, um, of uh, alignment. The first point is the occiput, and it, it's right here. It sits and lives right up at the top of the horse's head. Now, the reason I'm telling you about these, and this is really interesting with the Masterson work that, that I do as well, is that these are also considered by Masterson three of the main points of stress where the horses will uh, keep quite a bit of their... Uh, resistance and their, um, uh, you know, different different levels of, there's a word I'm looking for and I can't find it, but anyway, we'll say the stress points. But for me, it's the points of alignment. So this point here, the, the, the top of the head, the top of the withers right here, and then the top of the croup. So I like to look for the tuba sacrali and on her, they're right here. So these are the two bones that come together to form the, the top of their pelvis. Um, and there's one on each side, and it's, it's what you would probably refer to as the hunter's bump, certainly in England, I'm not quite sure in the United States, but right here is where hers are. Okay, those are your three main points of alignment. When the horse is out of alignment, nothing works. There is no rhythm that can be developed. The horse cannot engage its hindquarters the uh, balance cannot be achieved. So if you are not in alignment or what people call straight, um, you will not have any of the other components that you need to have a successful uh, relationship with your horse. So a lot of the heaviness that you come across with horses, a lot of the one-sidedness that you come across with horses is because they've not been taught how to align these three, these three spots. Now I do all of this in hand. And the reason I do it in hand is because as a human being, I am a predator. As a predator, I am a control freak. We are all control freaks, some of us more than others. <laughs> but as predators, we like to control the situation because we like to control the situation. This is where we tend to start manhandling the horse as opposed to relying upon his ability to think and then take what we've put in here, in its brain, in their brain, and then use that information to then maneuver all of this muscle mass, which is nice and small and lovely, which is why Gianna will be used quite a bit for these, these lessons. So she's going to maneuver all of this muscle mass because of the information I've put into her onboard computer. Rather than me being the onboard computer, trying to not only manage my muscle mass, which is already quite a bit of a, of a, of a thing to do. And as most riders know, uh, you know, trying to find your own correct position and balance on a horse is already difficult enough, let alone also having to then manage the muscle mass of the horse. It's much easier to teach them how to do it 
and then you only have to worry about your balance. And of course, if they're in balance, it's much easier for you to be in balance. It's not easy to sit on a horse who is out of balance. All of you know this, all of you have experienced it. Um, so the, the point of, of alignment that is really um, very, very important is that we are not going to worry about the head and we're not gonna worry about the croup. What we're gonna worry about is the shoulders. We're gonna worry about where this is placed by the horse because it's much easier to keep bringing the middle back to the middle between the two extremities than it is to try to, to get this part of the horse and this part of the horse to align with the middle. In fact, that's quite impossible, but yet a lot of riders are constantly being taught to micromanage the head and micromanage the, the bum, which means that the horse ends up having three conversations going on at the same time. The rider is talking to the head through the reins, talking to the croup with, with the legs, and then also trying to do all sorts of wriggling with their, with their bodies. A lot of you have been taught that you've got to swing your hips, to use your seat, to encourage your horse forward. Well, all that does is it puts a lot of stress and strain. And when I do that, I don't know if you can see it, but her back drops. So when her back drops and this gets contracted, that whole part of her hind, that means her hind quarters have just been lost. If you pull too hard on her mouth, the same thing will happen. You will absolutely, we will talk to you already sorted out. But the very first thing I wanted to do today, and we don't you know, have loads of times in these lives. So we're just introducing different ideas to you. But the very first thing that we really want to concentrate on is the fact that this part here, this part here, and that part here must be aligned. If her little nose goes over there and her shoulders come here, then she is out of alignment and she will be leaning to one side, which means that she will not be in rhythm. Her rhythm will be um, more like a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, rather than a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four at walk. It, and, and consequently the same thing at, at trot and canter. Um, and she will, so no rhythm will be there, no balance will be there. And certainly ambidexterity uh, just goes out the window as well as her ability to use her hindquarters um, the way that we would like her to use them. So this is the beginnings of what alignment is all about. What we will go on to talk to you about as we go through these lives is how you start to teach your horse to keep this part of her body, her because it's a little mare, uh, between the two extremities. All right, so um, just to remind you, you know, I, I have studied biology and, and equine behavior and all the rest of it up into a very high level, but I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible for everybody because what I've done is I've reduced it all down to something that is usable on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, being able to tell you all about the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments and their relationship to each other is great, but it is not practically, um, a, a, you, you, you can't use it practically to develop your horse. You've got to be able to always find within the tools that are being given to you, their practical application to what it is that you're trying to impart to your horse. So if it is not readily, easily for you to uh, translate as a, as a concept to your horse's brain, this is a different species completely, and one who is not necessarily, um, you know, as I said, signed on to our particular desires, uh, you, you've got to be able to make it as, as simple and as easy as possible for you to understand, for your students, if you happen to be an instructor, to understand and then for them to be able to impart to this very different species than us so that their brain can understand it and then their brain can control their muscle mass. That is incredibly important. You want your horse controlling his muscle mass, not you trying to control your muscle mass and theirs. That is a very difficult, hard job that leaves most of us red-faced and achy each and every time we get off our horses. So that's it for that. Um, that's the sort of a, a big beginning. And, uh, you know, if you are interested, 
in sort of following along with this, don't watch the video once or twice, watch it over and over again. You can you know, skip through the bits you don't want to look at. <laughs> and then um, start to kind of memorize the, the sort of beginnings of, of what this is all about. Because I can tell you from experience, and I have worked with hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of horses, and I have repaired hundreds and hundreds of horses. I have repaired them, not just worked with them and had no results, but I have taken horses that were literally on their way to the abattoir or like my big gray for one, um, and other horses that you'll be meeting as we go along through these lives. And I have been able just with alignment, just with these techniques of alignment to, to make them into horses that were able to have a happy and healthy life. So this is very important. And then for all you therapists out there, all you people that are doing body work, it's incredibly important for you to understand these, these sorts of things as well, because you're handing horses back that you've worked on, you've, you've, re, you've taken off you know, a, a lot of the pain that the horse might've been in, or you've relieved some of the tension in their muscles and you've, you've given back a, a really lovely horse to a rider who's, who, unless he knows how to do it, is going to just make the same mistakes again. And a few weeks down the road, you'll be called back in to do the same thing. And eventually the, the systems will break down permanently and, and then we'll, you know, we'll be back to calling out the vet because the vets will have to be injecting. And eventually the system breaks down and the horse has to either be euthanized or, or retired. So very, very important kind of things to remember. And these are easy theories uh, to put into practice. It's, it's nothing complicated, um, but it is years and years of work that has been distilled down to something that is easy to do. <laughs> so that's it for today. I think Monique might have some questions. Do you want to hand it back? Yes, I do. That was fantastic, Liz. Wow. Oh, good. And, and what a good little horse to just stand there and, and, and be so cooperative. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, yeah, she's lovely. Yes, Ross is just going to put her back outside now. And no, thank she... you, Ross. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate yeah. it. Oh, oh she, got... <laughs> she just walks underneath it. <laughs> oh, put the bar up so the big horses don't come in and bother but they've they've gone off into the backfield now anyway yeah. but no she, she's she's such a delight she doesn't run away she's you know as i said she doesn't founder she's perfect she's a perfect wonderful little addition to our herd and and i've i absolutely adore her everybody so, needs a nanny like that right everybody should have a shetland pony yeah, yeah. <laughs> So go get them in the Netherlands from the slaughterhouse. <laughs> so yeah, I do have a couple of questions. Um, okay. And of course, they're they're personal because yes. I, have a horse that I have a little bit of trouble with. Uh huh. He's the cutest horse in the barn. He really is. Everybody says so, not just me. He is the loudest horse in the barn, and he is quite opinionated. So. For example, this morning I got him out of his pasture and um, didn't feed him and um, got in the, in, the, in the arena or in the school, as you call, with him. And um, he just refused everything. He just, if I didn't walk with him, he mm -hmm. would just plant his feet and look at me. And then he would look at the barn. And then he would look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, and I don't know if I can do it. He would, you see what? His whole neck would go, over from his shoulders yeah yeah <laughs> so here's his body straight and here's his neck straight yeah and and but he would refuse to do anything so if i didn't walk with him and and keep him at the distance and then he wouldn't so how do you start with getting a horse to move his feet and he if he has a good work ethic when you're on his back let's put it that way Okay, well, I know a little bit about your background with with Eddie, and um, you know he's Arab, which is something that needs to be said because Arabs are um, very intelligent horses. I love them. I, well, I love all horses, but I mean Arabs are a breed that I really appreciate. My first horse was an Anglo Arab, and he was just amazing. Um, um, so he's he's also had an interesting background. So he's had some. 
um, classical dressage training. And by classical, I don't mean as in old style, I mean as in sort of tr traditional. Um, and one of the things I started to say was that there were three conversations going on with horses when people are trying to micromanage the head and the hind quarters into alignment or into what we call currently straight straightness, um, which means that the horse is being spoken to in what he considers three different languages to produce what's the, something that he doesn't even know what the goal is. So it would be a little bit like I you know, brought you into a language class and started speaking to you in French, German and Spanish all at once without telling you what it is I would like you to learn. And I don't mean one after the other. I mean all at once so that you'd have three teachers in front of you going blah, 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 <laughs> in languages that you don't understand. And you're, you're sent, you, you have to try to make sense of it all and, and figure it all out. Well, if you're on your horse doing something with your hands, something with your seat, something with your legs, leaning forward, leaning backwards, leaning to the right, leaning to the left. Now, you know why you're doing all these things. You've been taught how to do them. You, you, you expect a result from it. The books even say to you, if you do this, your horse will do that. Well, you now know all of you. <laughs> There's not one of you watching this that haven't got on that horse and gone, come on horse, you're supposed to be doing this. The book said so, the instructor said so, my friend said so, you know, and the horse goes, no, you know. So yeah. I think Eddie is probably having a little bit of that. I think he's probably confused. He's confused about your intent. You know what you want from him. You, you've made up your mind in it since we've met about what you're gonna do and how you're gonna change things and what, we, what you're going to achieve. And, and, and what you would like to do with Eddie in the future. But none of that has made it through to his mind, you know, because that is the problem is that we've got our ideas, but now we've got to then put those ideas to, to the animal and make him understand in a, as kind a way as possible what it is that we want from them. So Eddie's basically saying, nah, I, I, I don't know what you want. I'm confused. I've been confused for a long time. You don't really convince me that you know what you want. So I'm just going to do nothing. I mean, I'm not in his head. I'm not a horse. I don't, I don't speak horse. I don't think horse. But from an observation, um, you know, what we call empirical studies for years and years and years and years, I would say that that is probably what's going on is you've got a new idea, but you have an established relationship with this horse. And now you've changed your ideas, but you've got to say to him, right, Eddie, I, I know what I'm doing a little bit better now. Um, and this is what we're going to do. And, and, and I will, you know, help you with, uh, you know, we were going to do this uh, very video lesson with you. Um, so I will help you with all of that because it's not easy to do on your own just from things you read in a book. It's much easier when you've got the coach right there helping you. Right. Um, but that, that I believe is what's going on with you and Eddie. It's not okay. that he's reluctant, it's that he just doesn't quite know what's going on. And remember, if you, you've had two children and if your kids are not on board with your idea and they're not quite sure what you want and you're not quite sure how to deliver the message, Mm, especially as teenagers they're going to be like mm, nah <laughs> maybe not maybe not and and that is the feeling that i get from it that, he's a little yeah. background, that it's too much change and and so what i did and that it, he seemed to open up a little was just walk, walk on a long lead yeah stop, mm -hmm. and, and stop and and not doing anything with my hands just by my feet walk and stop mm -hmm. And, and go in circles and go and he and walk and stop. Yeah. And he kind of started to look at me and go, oh, we're doing something, huh? <laughs> so that was, a, that was a good thing. That was um, so suggesting to just keep going and something with him. One of, the, one of the very first exercises I do with any with any horses, keeping in mind if the horse is is approachable and a lot of horses I deal with are dangerous so you know I, I wouldn't recommend this with a horse that's trying to bite kick or attack um, but if you've got a horse that is relatively comfortable with human beings which Eddie is um, 
exactly what you're doing. Don't do it necessarily from a distance. Lead him as though you were going to be leading them. This is one of the first things that I think the Pirelli people do um, is they walk with the horse beside them. And I certainly do it and have been doing it for years. And I have my, and Andrew McLean also um, does teach this a bit. He, he calls it the go button and the stop button, which we will go into a little bit more deeply because though I had been doing something similar for years, I did go to Australia a couple of years ago to stay with uh, Andrew and, and Manuela McLean and do an exchange of, of um, information. And they were amazing, amazing to be with. And one of the things I took away from that experience was this is this putting in to horses, this stop and go button, uh, which we will talk about a little bit more. But what you can do with Eddie right now is, yes, just walk with him with your like a uh, dressage whip or um, I use a driving whip. I like them because they're the handle is long, but the um, floppy bit, the, the string bit is very short and it does make it a lot easier. Uh, now, I never, ever, 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 did I say that? Ever? <laughs> hit never, ever. <laughs> the whip, ever. They are not hit. They tap on occasion because this is part of, of some of the techniques that we use. And when I say tap, it would be something that um, if you did it to a human baby, it wouldn't hurt them. I mean, it is not painful. Maybe annoying, because that's what we are trying to elicit a bit of a response from the horse. But never, ever do I put anything that causes pain. If it's causing pain, it is not good. Yeah, and, the minute, and the minute you do that to your horse, there's a little spot in his brain that goes, mm that person is not to be trusted 100%. And then the second time you do it, oh, maybe it's a, you know, now I can't trust them 102% and then it's so on and so on. So at your peril, every time you use any kind of thing that is creating pain in the horse's body and therefore mind, because he will, that he will remember. They remember everything that is, you know, putting them in what they consider danger. So, um, so yes, yeah, so walk with your horse. Um, just do not use your lead line. This is something that humans do a lot. So the horse starts to, to lag behind and they, just to show you, they try to take the, the leading rein and, and, and like direct the horse. Mm -hmm. Don't with his mouth, don't touch his mouth. His mouth is there. Yes, you've got the lead line on him, but what you want to do is take the take the whip, whichever whip you, you have, and just tap, tap, tap him on the side, just gently tap, 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 until you've tapped him enough that he he comes sort of walking up to your, to your shoulder. So his head needs to be at your shoulder. If his shoulder comes to your shoulder and he shies in your direction, you're right in the path of danger. His head should be at your shoulder. So if he shies, his body goes behind you, not on top of you. That's very right. important. I've had several students that didn't listen and ended up in the hospital with broken ankles because the first thing the horse does is he steps sideways and he crunches your ankle. Yes. So don't, don't do that. But just say, come on, come with me, hop, 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 hop. You know, um, try not to use that. But if you know, if you do want to use a, a noise, make sure it's the same noise every time. Consistency is key. And just walk along with him. And then what you're going to do is you're going to slow the pace down because you want to slow your momentum. So slow your feet down. Horses know very well how to follow feet. And then stop. And he stops. If he runs around you, so if he goes in front of you and around. Now you can use the, the school wall because that sort of, you know, diminishes that because he's on a wall, so he can't swing his bum away from you. Um, but if he does go a little bit ahead of you, then you turn around to face him. Now, this is where the Pirelli people and I differ. Pirelli people will tell you to go, blah, 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 you know, or just, you know, shake the, shake the rain at him, which works beautifully well. It works really, really well. But, but what Andrew taught me to do is you touch the horse's mouth with, what, if he's got a, a head collar on, it's just so that it literally makes this teensy weensy little contact. If he's got a bit in the mouth, it's just a little tiny touch of his lips. And then if there's no response, which they may not be at first, you've got your, your dressage whip. That this is where you go tap, tap, tap on the, on, on the inside leg. But you do it again every time on the same spot. 
and you just tap, tap, tap until the horse makes an makes a move to go backwards and then you let go of everything you stop everything you reward the horse and then you go back and then ideally you're going to build up this sort of pattern of walking with the horse going backwards when he's gone ahead of you and very quickly you'll be amazed at how quickly this happens the horse stops when you stops goes when you go stops when you stops goes when you go um, next time we'll talk about the go button but that's the stop button okay so it's Perfect. and it's always the same thing you have got to say touch release because what you want the horse to do is to back up from the touch. He, it, so touch means something. You're going to develop in the horse's brain this idea that when we apply an aid, and this is again a, new, uh, a Normandy equine um, training technique, is that we do not teach horses the action of the aid. We teach them the meaning of the aid. So action of the aid would mean, Ro Ross, are you here? Right here? Can you come here, lovey? I'll, I'm gonna use you to demonstrate. Again, <laughs> so, uh, I'm gonna turn this around. Okay, so, so Ross is standing right here. Now, just turn to the side, sweetie. So action of the aid would be, here's my leg, this is my horse, here's my leg, right? And I want him to go to the right, so I'm gonna go, go to the right. Now, how did that feel, Ross? It put me off balance. It wasn't very nice. It wasn't very nice, it, was it? It, it was a bit aggressive and not very nice. But if I say to you now, Ross, if I put my hand on your shoulder, can you please take a step to the right? So I put my hand on your shoulder. How does that feel? Much better. Much better. Okay, thanks, sweetie. So there you go. So that is the meaning of the aid. Now, a lot of us human beings tend to believe that horses don't have the capacity to understand the meaning of something, but they do, they do, you know, they can feel an incredibly light feel and the lighter the feel, the more attention they pay. It's like these, um, these ladies that I hear sometimes and I hope I'm not going to offend anyone going in France. Okay, so in France, we'll, we'll, we'll pick on the poor old French ladies <laughs> going, allez, 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 when they've got a horse on the lunge line and these poor horses are like, oh my God, she's so loud. <laughs> I have ears that can hear five miles in each direction. I really don't need to be screamed at. And basically they're going, la, 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 you know, the horses. Um, it, it, the lighter, the less loud you are, the more your horse will pay attention to you. The louder you are, the brusker you are, the more you start to create resistance, whether it's mental or physical. So be very careful about that. But right. anyway, that is one of those Pirelli things as well. Although there is an, in, uh, a crescendo, right? You, you you put your finger on their 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 hair. Um, if they don't respond, you put a little more, a little more, and then until they it's so deep that they have to step away. But at that moment, the pressure is gone. Their again, their their um, idea is that the next time you won't have to press that hard, and ultimately it is just a touch and then move away. But the yes, horse feels a that, thigh. Yes, that, that is there, I believe. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been sort of studying. I've been, I went to a David Lichman uh, clinic and I also went to see this very nice young man, um, oh, Matthias Geisen. I went to a clinic of his just to see how they, he did his work. And the, the work is fabulous, but I have to say that the, the anatomically wise, the work that I do, which is very much based on do not mess up the work the surgeons have taken hours to fix. Okay, keep that in mind. That's where I'm coming from, is that I've watched these operations. I've watched these surgeons literally sweating for hours over these great big horses and, and, and repair, minute repairs that have meant beautifully done so the last thing i want to come and do is then is then destroy that work so everything that i do is is based on light and minimum and building strength a little bit at a time building suppleness a little bit at a time you know same thing with with the baby human learning how to walk you know confidence comes with time you know the baby will first learn how to walk then he learns how to jig jog a little bit will fall down several times then he's off and running then he's learning how to climb stairs you know everything is a little tiny bit at a time 
Well, with your rehabilitation horses, your re-education horses, and your baby horses, it's the same thing. Don't make them run before they can walk. They've got to be able to do all of this at the walk confidently before you start expecting them to do it at the trot and then at the canter and with you on their back. So it's, it's all slow, easy, but when I say slow, I'm not saying years. I'm just saying, you know, take your time. Don't expect in one session that your horse is going to learn how to PF. I've seen some dressage riders out there that will sit on a horse for three hours getting redder and redder and angrier and angrier at this poor animal because it hasn't done its PF quite the way that they want them to. And then they wonder why they break. Well, they break because mentally and physically, they just, they can't do it. So, okay, I have one more question. We're a really short answer, just a yes yeah. or no, uh, because we're running out of time. It's, it's yeah. we're, we're at it almost for half an hour. So, <laughs> Eddie writes, uh, Eddie, Kalina writes the horse and I do groundwork with him. Yeah. As long as she doesn't groundwork with, do, doesn't do groundwork and I don't write him, can we do our own thing or do we need to stop and do one thing? Um, no, I think that you can possibly do. I mean, I know that Kalina and I have spoken a couple of times and I think that she's starting to integrate some of the work anyway. But uh, yes, ideally, you would like to be able to do what you're doing on the ground will match what she's doing on his back. But that's going to take time. I mean, we're working at distance, which doesn't help. You know, I will be coming over to do clinics over there. And then, you know, we, when we're hands on, it's a lot easier, obviously. But yeah, no, start doing what, what you can on the ground. But, but, you know, confer with her. You're both working with the horse. The horse has to understand that there's unity between the two, the two people working with him and that the same questions are being asked from the ground that are being asked from, from his back. Um, and and it will be much easier. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, you know, I will do a little bit every day, um, just playing. I'm, I really see it as play. Good, uh, good. Just, you know, just go and play with the horse and, and, and walk, stop, walk, stop, maybe a circle. Uh, maybe <clears throat> see if he can get his shoulder and then he he can he can uh, i was specifically asking kalina is there one shoulder specifically she says you know he does whatever one time it's this shoulder next time it's that shoulder so wonderful i am so um thrilled about all those lives good yes me too <laughs> wonderful and i would say let's uh let's see if we can be on later this week Yes, I'm going away again uh, to Brittany to do some work down there, but I shall be back Friday. So maybe Friday would be a good day. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. We'll be in touch. Fantastic. Uh, we'll talk. Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.